Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, COVID-19 and the liver, reentry and return to a pre-pandemic state. My name is Kimberly Brown, and I'm pleased to be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the AASLD website and in liver learning. This webinar is being brought to you by AASLD and it's over 6,700 members. Our members are instrumental in creating exceptional educational content such as this webinar tonight, and I invite you to join us. You can play a vital role in bringing liver disease and treatment to the forefront and take advantage of the many member benefits we offer. Please visit aaslb.org to learn more about becoming a member. So the webinar agenda tonight uh, include our uh, contributors. Uh, I'll be presenting the introductions and then we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, briefly, I will go over one of the newer studies that is in pre-publication and then our expert consensus panel update will be given by Dr. Oren Fix. And then we'll move into really the three facets of reentry. Uh, Dr. Bilal Hamid will cover the outpatient reentry. Uh, Patricia Heron will cover the inpatient reentry. And Dr. David Mulligan, the transplant reentry. And then we will have an esteemed panel uh, discussion to go over many of the questions and answers that you may have. So this is the Clinical Oversight and Publication Subcommittee. These are the members that have contributed to uh, the publication as well as this and the other webinars that have been presented by ASLD. You will see on the bottom of your screen a Q&A box and uh, this will be important for you to use throughout the webinar. If you could please use this to type your questions, we will try to answer them either uh, in real time or uh, in written format. If you choose to use the chat box, we will ask you to copy and paste that into the Q&A so that we can read and respond to the questions that you have. So these are the presenters that we have today. Dr. Bilal Hamid, he's an associate professor of medicine at the hepatology clinic chief at the uh, University of California, San Francisco. He'll be talking about Reentry into the outpatient side uh, through the pandemic. Our second presenter will be uh, Patricia Heron. She is the clinical director of the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation and the clinical director for pediatric transplantation and adult abdominal organ transplantation at Columbia University. And then Dr. David Mulligan, who is professor of surgery and chief of transplantation and immunology at Yale University we'll be talking about reentry into transplantation during this time. We have a wonderful group of panelists, uh, Dr. Oren Fix uh, from Swedish, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Verna from Columbia University, Dr. Jamie Chu uh, from the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, Karen Hoyt, who was an amazing patient advocate, Dr. Guadalupe Garcia Sao uh, from uh, Yale University, Dr. Rotero Hirose from UCSF, and Dr. Gotham Reddy from the University of Chicago Medical Center. So before we begin uh, with our presentations, I just wanted to go over one of the most recent articles that has been published uh, uh, on COVID and looking at the risk factors associated with morbidity and mortality. This is the Open Safely study. Um, the title really covers the fact that this is, these are the factors associated with COVID-19 related hospital deaths and the linked electronic health records of 17 million adult uh, NHS patients in England. So the robust nature of this data set includes the fact that over 17 million uh, individuals uh, were recorded. Uh, these uh, individuals were recorded from February 1st of this year to April 25th, and the primary outcome was death in hospital in patients with a documented history of COVID-19. So there were almost 6,000 deaths that were looked at in this series. And what you can see on this slide is uh, this, the several factors that have been associated 
uh, in the past as well as currently uh, with morbidity and mortality due to COVID-19. The ones that we are well aware of, including uh, the age and sex of the patient. Um, but at the bottom, you'll see the robust nature of this uh, group of um, da data really show the fact and confirm some of our suspicions that patients that we care for with chronic liver disease, those who have been transplanted, and those who may be immunosuppressed, you can see that these patients too are at higher risk uh, of associated morbidity and mortality in the setting of COVID-19. So this is an important study, I think, because it is the largest cohort study to date, evaluating a wide variety of clinical factors uh, for death from COVID-19. One of the things that this confirms, the study confirms, is that Asians and Blacks appear to be at increased risk of in-hospital death. And this has been seen in previous smaller studies as well. And there was only a partial attribution to pre-existing clinical risk factors or deprivation. So this is an important thing, I think, for us to keep in mind when we're taking care of our patients. Patients who have pre-existing disease from, from liver disease, transplantation, or who are on immunosuppression appear to have increased risk of in-hospital death when adjusted for age and sex alone or when fully adjusted. So there are several strengths. Uh, the biggest strength is that this is the largest cohort study to date. It represents over 40% of the English population. And most importantly, uh, there was inclusion of variables of interest to us, including liver disease and transplantation for analysis. Of course, there are several weaknesses to this study as well. Uh, the first is that the deaths related to patients who had false negative tests or died without testing um, would have been missed. Uh, there was a censoring of data uh, at the date of death from other causes or outside the hospital, which stopped nine days short of study end. So there, uh, there was an incomplete data set at the end. And the cohort was limited to those practices that were using the software utilized for um, collection of data. Um, and this was variable based on the region in, um, in the country. And in particular, if you look at London, the largest metropolitan area, only 17% of those practices were using this software. So perhaps a, a misrepresentation in a, in a high density area. Uh, characteristic, uh, characteristic, characteristization of liver disease was general and, and not complete. And I think really um, we understand that uh, to characterize further uh, the, the, the several issues that relate to liver disease and the potential risks uh, due to the etiology, the MELD, et cetera, I think will be very helpful as we look to future studies. So our next presenter um, is Dr. Orrin Fix, who will uh, review uh, the updates to our expert panel consensus statement. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, go back to my last slide for a second. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we, um, this the committee that's put on these webinars, uh, developed this expert panel consensus statement that was first published online on the ASLD website March 23rd. And uh, we've just updated a, a new uh, version today. I think this is now the fifth update. You can find it at the website that's linked there, aslid.org slash COVID-19. Um, if you've downloaded a previous version, if you just click that orange box in the type right, top right corner, uh, it will automatically download the newest version. Um, and you can see from the table of contents that we've tried to cover a lot of ground. Uh, we also have Spanish and Portuguese translations available online and a published version um, in hepatology that's currently available online. Next slide, please. So I just want to go over some of the major changes we've made since the last update, uh, which was on May 4th. So in the last 10 days, we've added uh, an acknowledgement of this possible link between COVID-19 and Kawasaki-like pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome, uh, which many people are hearing about. Not clear if this is uh, related to the liver necessarily, but I think it's going to be relevant in terms of reentry uh, for our pediatric colleagues who want uh, to see their children, uh, the children in their clinics. Uh, there's an Italian autopsy series that was published uh, describing involvement of hepatic vasculature, including acute portal and sinusoidal thrombosis. This is relevant because we're hearing about the thromboembolic events that are associated with COVID-19, and this uh, may actually in involve the liver. 
And then uh, an introduction of SARS-CoV-2 antigen testing, in addition to what you're hearing uh, with increasing availability of antibody testing. And this will become uh, more apparent uh, as we learn more. Next slide, please. Um, you've already heard from Kim about the Open Safely study, so we mentioned that and the link between chronic liver disease and in-hospital in death from COVID-19. There's another study that's a U.S. study, also large but not as large as the Open Safely study, showing that chronic liver disease and cirrhosis are associated with higher COVID-19 mortality. So what we're seeing is more and more data coming out linking liver disease uh, with uh, mortality and, and poor outcomes in COVID-19. Next slide. So. Um, and then there's evolving data on, I think we, we skipped one slide. If you can go back one more. Um. Well, I can cover this and then if we are able to go back. The, um, I, I think uh, the, the last slide showed that we did in, involve some things, we added some things about masking. So most people now are, are having providers uh, wear surgical masks in, in patient care areas. We're also recommending patients and their caregivers and any visitors if you're allowing visitors to the, to the hospital uh, to also wear uh, surgical masks. Uh, we clarified the treatment of hepatitis B because th there's been some confusion from our previous versions. Um, we wanted to make clear that we don't think treatment of hepatitis B is contraindicated in patients whether they have uh, COVID-19 or not. It really depends on the clinical indications. Next slide, please. And then my last slide is uh, just uh, I mentioned on some treatment updates. Uh, there's some evolving data on hydroxychloroquine suggesting that it should no longer be used outside of randomized controlled trials. And there's new data on triple therapy with laponavir and ritonavir uh, plus ribavirin and interferon beta 1b showing more rapid viral clearance compared to laponavir ritonavir uh, alone. Uh, that's just phase two uh, randomized controlled trial data. And then lastly, uh, you don't have to go back, but um, there's uh, expanded uh, information about reentry, which is the topic of today's uh, webinar, so I won't go into that anymore. But I encourage you to go to our website, asld.org slash COVID-19 and download the newest version. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker will be Dr. Bilal Hamid, uh, who will talk about the reentry process uh, the safe reentry process in the outpatient setting. Uh, thank you, Kim. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, outline I would be discussing about the effect of COVID-19 on overall liver care. What are the recommendations for reentry uh, and reopening facilities? What challenges we are facing in ambulatory practices and our plan uh, specific at UCSF? And finally, how we can gradually re-enter our liver patient in the practice. Next. So impact of this pandemic is now clearly seen for patients with non-COVID diseases. Because of COVID-19, patients and families are scared to come to hospital even for emergencies. Next. We have seen in the US 38% reduction in activation of cath lab for ST segment MI. This is the data which was just published in American College of Cardiology from nine big centers. And again, pointing the same factor that our patients do need reassurance that with the symptoms of their emergencies, they need to come to the hospital. The preventive healthcare aspect has also uh, been seen a decline, especially in vaccination, uh, which was the CDC updated data. Next. So we will gonna see the unexpected consequences. We all aware that on March 18, to expand the capacity of COVID-19 patients, CMS recommended limiting non-essential care and procedure. What it has led to uh, almost an eight week pause in usual care activities we talked about fear of patient coming, but at the same time, there is a change in perception of patient's risk and benefit. Some of the procedures patient was easy to get and beneficial now questioning about the risk of infection. Uh, but on April 19th, uh, CMS did allow uh, that areas with low and stable incidence can presume a non-emergent and non-COVID healthcare. Next. So, the response to cirrhosis care during this pandemic is very um, impressively shown on this uh, picture by Dr. Elliot Tepper and his colleague. So we are dividing the cirrhosis care impact at the COVID-19 pandemic in three phase waves. The first wave we are in when we 
have a surge and we are taking care of COVID-19 patient, we have seen decline in living donor transplant, selected disease donor transplant, imaging and follow-ups. And then the second wave, when we will kind of resume uh, our regular clinic operation, we will see a backlog of patients, uh, a big number of missed visits. And these patients who were considered low risk in the first wave will be coming in with more decompensation. And we will see, uh, we will gonna see transplant waitlist drop out. And the third wave, which will gonna happen uh, years down the road, we will see a lot of misdiagnosis, incomplete cancer screening and progressive disease. So how, what we can do that we can bring some of these patients or provide the care between the first and second wave. And we need to be innovative and flexible at this time. At the same time, understanding that we will have more COVID surges when the states will start opening, the schools or colleges will open. So we need to be ready and continue to provide the excellent care for our liver patients. Next. So in the uh, at UCSF, in our hepatology practice, uh, before the COVID-19, 20% of our total visit were video. The currently, we are doing about 95% of total visit. Uh, when we were looking at our planning for the future, we feel that it may be the telehealth will be staying for a long period of time, and we are anticipating half of our patients uh, will still be seen through telehealth we can have to expand it that for patients who live far away and also for some of the chronic disease management. And this will also help us free up the clinic space, which will be important for social distances and uh, so that we were not able to see that many patients in the clinic. So telehealth will help in that regard. Next. This is our overall UCSF video visit. Uh, from 2015 to April 2020. So only 2% of all visits before the COVID-19 were video visit. And we all have seen that in one week, how we practice manage, manage uh, patient and practice medicine has changed for all of us. And now about 60 to 70% of all visits are done through video at UCSF. And in April, we did 60,000 visits. Next. And this is our data from our UCSF hepatology practice, about 800 uh, video visit uh, in March and April. So we can able to continue to provide some form of care and uh, manage our patients. And we were lucky that we did not have a significant drop in the number of patients uh, if we compared even before uh, uh, COVID-19. Next. So CMS did came up with recommendation, phase one recommendation about reopening facilities for non-emergent healthcare. Uh, but it's very important that the, it's clear in the guideline that we have to work with a state and local public health official to evaluate the incidence and trend for COVID-19 in our own area, prioritize the procedures and high complexity care. Uh, important to have a non-COVID care zone that would screen all patients for COVID symptoms and we need to have sufficient resources across the different phases of care, including PPE, healthy workforce, and testing capacity. And very importantly, we cannot jeopardize our search capacity. If we can fulfill these requirements, uh, we can start opening R for re-entry and recovery planning. Next. So why we are talking in San Francisco and UCSF. So uh, we were anticipating a surge, but luckily our numbers did not increase. We have total close to 2000, our deaths uh, total uh, 35, but very stable in the last seven days. Next. So our principle for ambulatory re-entry and recovery is we want to ensure that morbidity and mortality for liver patients do not increase during this time and continue to provide the care in a safe manner, prioritize the health and safety of workforce and prioritize urgent patient and communicate consistently and transparently. Next. So how I look at this ambulatory recovery challenge and plan that in the center of everything, our heart is our patient care. The first thing is how we can be sure that our staff and patients are safe and how we can convince that they can come back. We have amazing COVID symptom check. Every health employee coming to UCSF get a health check. Our patients at the entrance of the hospital and the clinics are getting a COVID symptom check. We have social distances in place. We have universal masking policy and safety policy, weight room changes and visitor policy. Uh, next. 
So clinic flows are very important, even if your hospitals and facilities are a little bit behind, but you need to have protocol. We are prioritizing our urgent patient now. We are going over our backlog data and referral. Uh, Pre-clinic communication with patients are important. They need to expect when they come to the clinic, what are the new changes and having new in-clinic flows. Uh, resource utilization is important. We need to optimize uh, our schedule because we're not able to see as many patients because of all these policies. We have to be flexible. There are options of extended clinic. Uh, our GI colleagues are planning to do weekend endoscopies. We need to utilize our space really well, sustain the telehealth, and we are invested in uh, investing in digital technology for symptom monitoring. The support and education of our um, uh, patients and our staff is very important. Uh, the communication is very key. We are constantly in contact sending our patients messages that this is safe now to seek medical help, uh, working with our staff anxiety, and also uh, physician burned out, which is a real thing, and we will be starting seeing it more in the future. And importantly, how we can have our trainees and fellows re-enter into clinic space and, and so that it cannot jeopardize their education. Next. These are some of the things we have protocols of how to clean rooms. Visual management is the key. Uh, and uh, I think having the social distances and chair and in the waiting room. And also we have uh, in the front desk, we have got these plastic and the, uh, uh, to make sure that we cover our front desk and it's very easily available. So these are all the, some changes that we are doing in our clinic space for re-entry. Next. We are using technology. So as I mentioned, all the employees uh, through the digital app uh, get cleared in the morning. We are now having uh, through our Epic uh, patient scan go on before coming to the clinic. It's like a fast track that once they get it, they can clear it and get the mask on arrival. And through Epic, uh, we will have a new uh, way that once patient, uh, because of our waiting rooms are small, they can be waiting outside and they can get a text through our electronic medical system that, they are, that we are ready for them so that they come in. Next. So uh, what are we doing right now for our liver transplant evaluation? So obviously with all of our care, um, uh, we were limited by how many patients we can see. So we were focusing on high melt of greater than 24 or patient with ACC requiring melt exception. If your melt is 20 to 24, uh, if there are complications, we were seeing them on site, but only one caregiver was allowed. On the day of eval, uh, after checking their vitals and frailty testing, they put in the room and every room has a Zoom and video capacity. So a lot of our educational visits were still done uh, remotely, and, uh, but the hepatologist and surgeon, depending on who is available, were seeing these patients in person. But if you don't, next slide. Uh, so, but if you don't have any of these criteria, we were doing a modified evaluation with hepatology and social worker as video visit. And, uh, and when the remainder of evaluation will be on site when restrictions are lifted. Next. So based on everything, and next month, we are now gonna be start seeing all the new liver transplant evaluation and, diagno and HCC diagnosis in our clinic, or any new decompensation, listed patient with decompensation, acute hepatitis, and also especially patients who have difficulty with telehealth. Next. The ACC surveillance has a lot of questions as in our guidance, we wanted to continue as close to possible, but the delay of two months were acceptable, but now we have more capacity. We're working on all the delayed imaging and prioritizing them with risk categories. Known ACC surveillance for treatment and elevated are getting the priority, but the other patients are also being scheduled. The key is working with radiology, giving an option to have local imaging. But importantly, communication is the key with patients and documentation, everything, if there's a delay. As all as societies, and including our, we are not delaying any HCC treatment, but going over risk and benefit. Uh, liver biopsies, were uh, we were doing um, already for all the uh, cases of rejection, rule out, and autoimmune, but now we are going over backlog and prioritizing liver biopsies starting next month, and there will be more scheduled biopsies. We're also updating our radiology protocol, but we are not doing COVID testing for outpatient biopsies, but using standard PPE. We all agree that fibroscan are not urgent, but we have a huge backlog of fibroscan, and we are starting... Uh, end of June or early July, and we are using our radiology ultrasound protocol for PPE. All of our technicians will be wearing mask, goggles, and gown. Uh, next. So in the end, we have to 
coexist with COVID-19 because it's not going anywhere soon, but important to break the silos. We need to learn from each other. We need to work across the region to continue to provide the excellent care during this time. And lastly, I wanted to say thank you for all the nurses uh, who works uh, really hard and make a difference every day uh, for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal. That was a great presentation. And next, we'll move to the inpatient side. Uh, Patricia Heron will talk about reentry and return to a pre-pandemic uh, state. Patricia? Okay, thank you. Can I have the first slide? So institutions are under major financial constraints due to the lack of operative and ambulatory services. This is draining their financial reserves that combined with the increased number of high acuity admissions exceeding bed capacity, increased cost of supplies and overtime staffing, increases, increasing need for expensive equipment like beds and ventilators, and again, increase in laboratory expense for the um, large amount of testing that has done has put several institutions in a position that, that makes their future uncertain. Next slide. Overcapacity struggles were in the emergency room. The emergency room used to be a place where people would come, get triaged, and move through. Now it's generally split into four areas. COVID, known COVID positive, non-COVID patients, patients waiting on their COVID testing, and patients waiting for inpatient beds or ICU. In the ICUs, um, bed capacity has gone um, increase for all institutions. In New York Presbyterian alone, system-wide, we went from 422 beds to 970 beds in 19 days. Our OR suites are still needed today um, for ICU patients. Their um, entire unit, floor units, are still a mix of step-down and ventilated ICU patients. Um, and only recently, we have been able to um, free up one of our CT ICUs for, um, to be a COVID-free, multifunctional ICU. Also, what we struggled with was dialysis. Um, the increased need for CVVH and hemodialysis staffing um, and supply issues, um, reagents, um, filters, et cetera, um, and beds. We still have a high volume of COVID patients admitted. Uh, patients um, are, um, I'm sorry, so it's still a high volume of patients admitted. Um, and so patients stay on the vent for many weeks. So then finally they need a step down bed. Um, so we need to funnel these patients down from step down to floor beds to rehab beds, um, which has been an increased need and a resource um, a lot of places are um, utilizing. And also at Columbia, we had to open a field hospital to help move the more stable patients um, closer to discharge out so that we could bring our IC patients um, down. Next slide. So PPE, um, or is improving, but there are still shortages nationwide. And some states, including New York State, is suggesting slash mandating that institutions need a stockpile of a 90-day supply of all PPE equal to the amount we used at peak. So for say, for system-wide, we are currently, we, at peak, we were using 100,000 surgical masks a day. We need to have 9 million in reserve, plus currently what we need. Um, this compounded by the increased prices and low availability is a struggle. You know, we were paying cents for masks um, and now we're paying dollars for masks. So this is a definitely an increased um, cost and nobody expects this to happen tomorrow, but it's something that we need to strive to, to be prepared for the next emergency um, that comes in the future. Next slide. So here's a slide of cases compared at um, Columbia. Our transplant cases, um, first two quarters of 2019 compared to 2020. And you'll see over on the right that in April and May, um, virtually um, no cases were done. And I'm sure this is representative to, from what I'm hearing throughout the country. Um, next slide. So 
what do we need to do? It's also representative of a many other surgical specialties. So institutions need to get their ORs back up and running. Um, and so we need to convert our OR, um, ORs back from ICUs to operation, operating rooms, which is a construction project. Um, we need to keep, have more COVID-free ICU and units for those non-COVID patients to go to. Um, we need rapid COVID testing um, is needed for aerosolized procedures. Um, and um, we need to get our um, radiology, interventional radiology and cardiac catheterization labs back up and going. Um, this has been a struggle because staff um, has been pulled from these areas to help, help staff the ICU beds. Next slide. So for COVID testing, currently we're looking um, for most case, any kind of case, um, we want a negative PCR um, within 48 hours. We're doing rapid PCR testing, which takes about one to two hours from collection to result um, for procedures, regardless of if they're aerosolized or not. Um, but this is becoming more the norm, even for basic radiology testing. Um, and we're going to, con we are considering rapid testing for all elective admissions and transfers. And so when patients are coming in, they will go to a holding area for, for a direct admit, get swabbed, make sure that they're negative or positive so they go to the correct type of unit. And then the same thing for transfers. They'll come in through our emergency department, go to a holding area until their rapid test is negative um, and then, or positive and go to the bed that they're slated for. Um, and certainly broader testing in the coming weeks is, uh, to months is going to be needed to monitor for any outbreaks. Um, next slide. So again, staffing concern. To run the hospital, we need adequate staffing and the right type of staff. So we still have many um, deployed um, staff members, um, especially from departments like cardiac cath that are still needed to help with the ICU care. Um, this strains the ability for those departments to reopen. We have an increased number of travel staff who have been um, very helpful and invaluable, but that is an, a, large um, a large expense um, when you consider their salary, agency fees, and housing expenses. And they're on contract, so there's no guarantee that they will um, continue on with the assignment. Um, units are no longer specialized. You used to be, a, if you were coming in for your knee replacement, you would, after surgery, go to a orthopedic um, specialized unit. Um, and so those patients currently don't have the benefit from um, the specialized nursing unit. In the short term, they were going to a non-COVID multi-specialty unit um, for their care. Um, and so that, you know, you might be dealing with nurses who are not familiar um, with that type of procedure. And employee PCR and antibody testing, when and how often? Well, guidance seems to still be in flux, but I think we're all going to test everybody with or without symptoms, both PCR and antibody testing. Next policy. Uh, so visitation policy. So this has gotten a lot of media uh, attention because it's so drastic, but eventually, currently we're still in a position where no visitors are permitted unless uh, for adult units unless patient is on a palliative care unit and here for an, um, coming in for an end of life visit. Patients um, are hesitating to come to the emergency room or for any admission, but certainly when the amount of COVID cases drop, our ERs e seem to be almost deserted. And we were like, where are the patients with appendicitis? Where are the patients having heart attacks? Those things don't go away. So where are those? And we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But we have, staff has increased amount of struggles trying to contact families about changes in patient statuses, um, trying to do Zoom meetings with family about making um, care decisions. That's really very difficult when you can count on um, them to be able to come into the unit. And certainly discharge coordination has been um, difficult. Next slide. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, we, we learned that we most certainly have to start with more restrictions and more protection and reduce as data indicates. We lost a lot of patient, uh, staff for 
being out on quarantine because we were using um, probably not the amount of protective equipment um, based on guidelines um, that we should have been. Now I think that's much improved, but I think we did the good job of limiting visitors right from the beginning. Um, testing, more testing of staff, certainly, more testing, not just with symptoms, and that's both staff and patients. Testing non-COVID inpatients periodically, especially if they're going for procedures. You know, we're doing our best to keep the non-COVID units non-COVID by keeping phlebotomy and x-ray and those type of staffing in pharmacy when we can, um, away from the diff cross covering both types of COVID and non-COVID units when possible, but it's not always possible. So we always have to suspect that these patients might have been exposed during their inpatient stay. Secure your valuable PPE. It will be valuable and very expensive for a very long time. And we learned that the increase in telemedicine, which a lot of us were reluctant to do early on, has proven to be incredibly valuable in a way of engaging with our patients um, and is certainly needed, still needed now and um, in the future. Next slide. So we see that um, these are some news article headlines. Um, Doctors worry about coronavirus is keeping people away from US hospitals as ER visits drop. And again, heart attacks don't stop. And I think we'd all agree with that. Um, and is it safe to go to the hospital during COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and this is recent and doctors say yes. And I think we've done a lot and we feel very comfortable um, saying to patients, yes, please come. We, we have the ability now to keep you as best as anybody can um, COVID free. Next slide. But how do we make patients feel safe to return? Well, we have to project confidence. People respond to tangibles. When they come in, when they're called on the phone, they have to be reassured um, that we, you're going to a COVID-free unit. We're going to test you day of. Um, we're testing people. Um, screening at all the entrances. Um, we're doing this even in our outpatient setting, but pa people coming in who are allowed in, um, any kind of visitors or certain staff are getting thermal temperatures at the door, at the entrances, things like that. We're screening, we're screening everybody. Everybody needs to be wearing masks, everyone all the time. And not around your chin, not below your nose. Your masks have to be worn properly because as patients um, and their families do start to visit your institution again, they're gonna be looking for this. Um, do testing pre-admission, pre-procedures absorb, having them absorb very good hand hygiene. If you're testing them, they know you're testing everybody. If you're observing good hand hygiene, if they're seeing it um, and, pra and you're encouraging them to practice themselves while on um, the units, then um, they're gonna feel more confident that it's happening consistently and just being consistent. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That was really an excellent overview of all the challenges that I think we're facing as we try to get patients back into our inpatient space. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Mulligan, he's going to tackle the idea of how we bring people back to transplantation uh, during this time. David? Thanks so much, Kim, and thank you all for uh, attending this. So we've heard two great talks about what are going on with COVID in the outpatient ambulatory system, and now I'd like to focus more on the inpatient side, especially when it comes to our transplant patients. I show this slide because it reminds us that COVID was reported in mid-December in Wuhan, China. And by mid-January, um, they had done, on the, on the 20th, they had done their last uh, liver transplant at the Tanji Hospital, and they went on uh, lockdown on the 23rd. Now notice the dates here, by March uh, 19th, they finally had peaked and had no new COVID cases. And then about three and a half weeks later, they began the reopen of their hospitals, resuming liver and kidney transplants with all staff continuing to be screened for PCR and antibodies and continuing to use full PPE um, for their surgeries. Next slide. 
Similarly, in Spain, um, they had the, the same activity. The, the number of donors uh, started to decline in early March, similar to, the, to what we saw in the US. And you could see the drop in the donors and the do drop in the transplants um, all occurring at the time of their national alarm state, which was in mid-March. So through from March till late April, they were in the national alarm state. And then as they started to, to re-escalate, they were able to, to increase the number of both organ donation and slowly transplantation. And one of the things that you know notice on the lower right-hand side here is that the number of donors that were more expanded donors and the, and the donation after circulatory death donors had been reduced significantly so that they could focus on just brain dead donors uh, on the early phase. And then as it would re-escalate, the plan was to, to integrate the more, um, the more higher risk donors that would keep patients in the hospital a little longer time or that may have a greater risk of, of uh, non-function or early graft dysfunction. Next slide. So what happened in the U.S.? The UNOS OPTN um, website on COVID-19 divides the U.S. into these regions. Now, note, most notably, it's the Northeast where New York is combined with New England as the Northeast region, and the rest are just geographic. And I show you that because on the next slide, you can see what has happened to, um, to the U.S. numbers. Uh, the, the next slide shows overall the deceased donors uh, declining uh, from the early March. They dropped about 50% by the time we were in the third week of March and have had some, some recovery to, to about 20, uh, about 25% or so of a drop. And as you can see to the right, the biggest drops were found in certain regions like the Northeast, which were the hardest hit. Um, and you can see a drop. But there were other areas of the country that didn't see as much drop like in the mid-Atlantic areas um, and somewhat to the to the Texas Oklahoma area the South Mid West where they were able to continue to do transplants at about the same rate, rate as they've been doing before next slide and so as so as you look by organ of course the most uh, organs affected were the kidney transplants in that top blue line and livers are in that green line the second line from the top uh, and you can see how the liver uh, transplants had dropped and then there's been about a half of recovery just like we saw with donors and as you can see on the on the graphs to the right those are variable again depending on regions next slide when you see living donor uh, liver transplants and living donor kidney transplants, these have been dropped the most. Uh, again, the worry about the exposure for healthy living donors into the hospitals where they may be exposed to COVID instead of staying home and staying safe were the biggest drivers for this. And that's a big, uh, a, a big important factor as we look at reentry to consider when is it safe to bring these living donors back into this environment and out from their homes as we as we reactivate. Next, uh, the next slide. We see that when you when you look at uh, the study done by Betsy Verna and Bachi Ogapian and Dave Goldberg, that what they looked at was that just what we're seeing in these trends in these slides. Not all transplant centers um, noticed the decreased in their liver transplants and in organ donation as much as others. And some of it had to do with COVID penetration and some of it had to do with what we just heard about, the resources that are in the hospitals that were related to their ability to shell, uh, save places in the hospital that would be COVID spared um, and, and away from exposing the patients and they were able to do that with the resources that they had, which is important as we consider re-entry. So when you look at Ontario, Canada, the largest province in Canada, they experienced again a very similar uh, uh, thing that we saw when it's when it's um, as we saw in the U.S. On, Ontario has eight transplant programs with adult and pediatric transplants, and they grouped together and collaborated right away and had daily calls and to manage the big drop in organ donation, which for them was down 58 percent, and they and compared to the uh, 2019 data, and you can see that. You can see that um, that the Ontario uh, experience and the number of transplants pretty much paralleled what we saw in the U.S. in their province. Next slide. 
And at, at Yale, recognizing that our patients, uh, being in New Haven, Connecticut, which has some of the, uh, we were the fourth hardest hit city in the U.S. with COVID uh, so far, um, we saw a high incidence of, of COVID pre uh, prevalence in our hospital. We still have over 350 patients in the hospital with COVID, but we're proud to now have under 100 in the ICUs and actually in the 50s on the ventilator right now. But when we look at our, our priority for liver transplants, all along we've had to stratify the urgent emergent cases, as you can see in the top two boxes, uh, without without trying to restrict transplants uh, away from those patients because of the risk benefit for them to carry on with cirrhosis. And sadly, we've seen patients with end-stage liver disease not make it to transplant uh, because there wasn't a donor or they weren't eligible uh, because of infection. Uh, as we re-escalate, we'll certainly be looking to expand into the semi-urgent uh, patients as we heard about earlier and try to expand transplant because these patients don't do well because of their background liver disease. Next slide. As we see, as we see in um, the Canadian experience, there on, on their re-entry, they definitely have noted that trying to do this re-entry is quite difficult and takes a lot of collaboration. But in a similar fashion to what we've been doing at Yale, you can see how uh, implementing a priority so that you can try to do the sickest patients and get those patients transplanted early on, they're using uh, a color scale to try to, to implement. They've been able to successfully start to uh, perform liver transplants again, and again, hoping to build in their living donor experience with their starting to do now. Next slide. This is our algorithm for how we bring our patients through. And I think this is a great template to consider for programs when they're looking at trying to have a re-entry pathway. A patient needs to know where to go to come into the health system and how to try to come in in a way to avoid going to a place where COVID might be. We don't want them to be exposed to COVID in any way, shape, or form. And this has been being modified as we're seeing less COVID patients in the hospital having a, a, a tighter ability to bring a patient in, do their testing, because every patient gets tested on a rapid test, the two-hour test, before we're then admitting them, pre-oping them, and then going right to the OR. After the OR, we have to have an ICU, which is separated uh, from the COVID ICUs, and to be able to manage those patients with a fairly high confidence that there's not going to be other patients with COVID coming through uh, that system. And as they leave the ICU and go to the floor, we wanna make sure that that transplant floor is dedicated to be COVID minimized. And every patient, regardless of what service goes to that floor is screened with a test before they get there. And right now we're in, in the process of even screening all the healthcare workers that work on our transplant floor so that we can avoid COVID exposure. Next slide. So, so when, some of the additional considerations that, that I think are important to note is that when recipients are tested, we want to look at, do we test them just immediately prior to transplant? Is it worthwhile to test a recipient at discharge? Uh, the University of Utah spoke about doing this so that they can try to discover how many recipients have been exposed to COVID and are discharged COVID positive, but don't have symptoms. I think that's useful knowledge. Um, some transplants, if, they're, if they have enough time for uh, transplantation and or they're, they're thinking about living donation, may test a recipient twice before transplant to make sure that they're not COVID positive. As we know, there's been negative reports for COVID uh, in, in those patients. We also want to try to think about um, direct visits and how many of those visits are versus telehealth, as well as the number of uh, caregivers uh, and, and whether we should be considering testing the caregivers who will be exposed to our patients in the post-op period. And should there be a quarantine after their discharge to try to, again, protect them from, uh, from the 
COVID. In the, in the restart for living donation, which is a final strategy, uh, we want to think about testing uh, donors um, uh, before surgery and do we test them twice? Uh, is, that, is that a consideration that we might want? And would we test them and then have a quarantine period uh, prior to then proceeding to bring them in the hospital and do a donor hepatectomy? And then at discharge, how would we want to consider a safe pathway for the living donor? Owners to avoid uh, avoid exposure to COVID, and how do we use telemedicine to do that? Next slide. So, in conclusion, as you can see, planning reentry and transplantation is much more difficult and complex than just shutting things down during the COVID pandemic. We have to put a lot of effort into trying to determine the correct timing. When is it time to start reentry? Do you look at the prevalence of COVID in your community? You have to look at their hospital staff, the space, their supplies, blood product supplies and resources, and adequate pre and post testing and the speed of those testing. And, and then you have to have the ability, I think, which is really important, to be flexible so that you can handle changes that may occur as communities reemerge and you get and you get a rebound uh, of COVID. Next slide. I'd like to thank the AASLD. It's been a great honor to serve on this COVID-19 task force and the chairs, Ray Chung and Raj Reddy, who have been uh, leading this effort along with Oren and, and his team. It's been phenomenal and I want to, uh, it's been a great honor to be the uh, surgeon on this community and, uh, and, and to keep going through. And it's been a great op opportunity to speak to you and we're happy to answer questions at this time. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, really. The, these were three great presentations. I think they really uh, highlight the multiple complexities that we're facing with bringing these patients back into our care and sort of starting services up again at all of our institutions. And I know um, all of us have had somewhat of a different experience. Uh, we have several questions here. And the first, actually, David, before, before we let you off the hook, uh, one of the questions that came through was, uh, do we have a sense of the percentage of patients that are dying on the transplant list right now with the reduction in donations and the overall reduction in transplant? You know, that's a great question. And, and I, think that, I think that there are, um, there's a significant number of, of patients that have been dying on the wait list. I have not seen the data yet. Um, I, I know it's out there. And I know that in our own uh, personal uh, situation that we've had a number of patients who were very ill and uh, did not have the opportunity to get a liver transplant. But I don't know those numbers. But I would say that my sense is that they're up. Great, thanks. Uh, so we have a, a number of other questions. So, so Rio, as uh, there's several for our surgeons here, uh, one of the questions uh, that we have is, uh, in a patient who is, um, ha has a positive test, uh, asymptomatic, they're called in for transplant, uh, what, are, what are you guys doing? Uh, would that be a patient that you would take to the OR or is that a patient that you would cancel? At this point, we would cancel that case, and that's at UCSF. Um, we have a pretty low prevalence rate in the Bay Area, but um, given the limited knowledge that we have of how post-up, post-transplant patients do, especially if they get early infection with COVID-19, I think um, the cautious approach would probably be to not proceed, um, particularly if you have um, a very recent positive test. Um, you know, it's a little bit problematic if you have a positive test and the patient has quote unquote recovered or has spent a lot of time in recovery, like four, 14 days, I still would be relatively hesitant given some of the late sequelae that we've uh, seen most recently being described. Yeah, I think that's pretty consistent uh, around the country. Um, so the question I really want to ask you, and I don't think we're sharing information that we shouldn't be sharing, but, but you're actually a provider for patients uh, who are immunosuppressed and undergoing transplantation, and you yourself have experienced this infection. Um, so from a personal standpoint, having uh, gone through this, what were some of the considerations from an infectious standpoint that 
that you had to consider as you came back into a patient-facing role uh, with our patients who are immunosuppressed? Yeah, now that's a great question because, you know, the stress of actually knowing you have a life-threatening illness and, uh, you know, as a physician and transplant surgeon, you almost know too much about it, and yet we know very little. And by that, I meant, um, well, just to be brief, I, I came down with COVID-19, got, got hypoxic, was admitted, um, had to be on supplemental oxygen, and was in the hospital for three or four days. And yes, I took hydroxychloroquine. Yes, I took um, uh, ZPAC. And yes, I was enrolled in the remdesivir trial as my ID um, colleagues uh, uh, advised me to. After four days in the hospital, I improved. And then, you know, here I was two weeks out and wondering when I can go back to work. Well, the CDC has two different pathways for people, for healthcare workers with confirmed COVID-19 uh, disease. One is a symptom-based tra- strategy in which you basically have to wait at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared, then have at least three days in a row or 72 hours since basically the recovery of no fever without any Tylenol or ibuprofen and an improvement in your cough and shortness of breath. Well, I met that very shortly after my uh, discharge, about 10 days after that, I had met that criteria. But because I was going to be um, exposing potentially um, myself to patients that are immunosuppressed, my occupational health department um, chose the second pathway, which is the test-based strategy, which is basically including all those things, but also with two consecutive specimens uh, based at least 24 hours apart, two negative tests, and uh, um, that that for us is the RNA-PCR that we do here. And unfortunately, I was one of those people that kept on turning up positive. So after 14 days, I was still positive. After 21 days, I was still positive. After 28 days, I'm still positive. So more than a month out, I'm having these multiple, essentially transnasal brain biopsies. It's sort of uh, uncomfortable. But um, uh, I finally turned negative um, more than a month out. And my ID specialist friends said, well, that may just be fragments of RNA that may not represent um, intact contagious uh, virion particles, but nonetheless, that's what my occupational health folks said. Um, ironically, at the same time I was testing positive for RNA, I was also positive for IgG. But the long and short of it is, I did eventually test negative twice, and I did have titers measured in my IgG, so I'm maybe um, uh, donating my plasma. But the bottom line is, I think. It was an abundance of caution. I think it was the right thing to do to go the test-based strategy, especially if you're a surgeon or physician going to be taking care of um, immunosuppressed patients. And even then, we still don't know uh, some critical questions like how immune am I, um, how long, if any, uh, does that uh, immunity last, those critical questions that I would like to know. But um, I'm back in the saddle and have performed a several transplants in the last few weeks, so it feels good to be back. Thanks. I, you know, that's an amazing story to share, and I think it illustrates um, a, a lot of what we're facing, which are all the, all the confusion about what to tell our, our healthcare providers um, when they are infected and when they can come back safely. Um, but, but to your point, uh, the complexity of not really knowing a lot of how the clinical course of this goes and and, and what the right answer is, but, but I, appreciate, um, I appreciate that, um, that story. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to uh, change gears a little bit and talk about kids because we don't really talk about pediatrics much. Um, and, and Jamie, there's a question here. So initially we were all feeling pretty good about the fact that this disease didn't seem to fortunately affect kids. Um, and, then, and then we started to see some reports about uh, children who were having um, uh, poor outcomes uh, seemingly related to COVID. And I'm wondering if you can share your experience and how this has affected your approach to your patients, but also um, their parents um, and their caregivers. Uh, thanks, Kim. That, that's a really um, very timely question right now that we're facing here in New York. Um, the emergence of these cases of 
pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome, as it's been called, has um, really uh, certainly caused our patients and their families to be very hesitant to come back to the hospital or clinic um, for in-person patient care. Um, in New York State, we've had over 100 of, 100 of these cases, with the majority being from New York City. Um, at Mount Sinai, we saw our first case of this syndrome um, you know, in late April on the 24th and have admitted one, sometimes two children per day with this syndrome. Um, it's important to note, I think, for the audience that these cases present with prolonged fevers, rash, mucous membrane involvement, very little cough or respiratory symptoms, but they all seem to present with moderate to severe abdominal pain, some with vomiting, diarrhea. Um, uniformly, these patients all have increased IL-6 levels and are COVID antibody positive some being COVID-2 PCR negative, some being COVID-2 PCR positive, but all of them are COVID antibody positive, suggesting a post-infectious entity. Um, they progress to endothelial and cardiac dysfunction fairly quickly. Some progress to shock. Um, the liver injury, despite even the most severe cases, is often mild in these cases. Um, and in terms of course of illness, the positive news is that the majority have all recovered over a four to 10 day hospitalization. And for the patients that we've already discharged, some have already come back for their um, you know, post-discharge cardiology visit and they actually seem to be doing well. So that's a positive note, but it's certainly something now in the pediatric realm that we are dealing with, especially as we try to begin re-entry. Thanks. That's, um... It's, uh, it's scary for us to think about uh, kids getting this, um, especially for a lot of even our caregivers um, and our, our own uh, clinical staff that are putting themselves at risk and, and often have very much uh, concerns about taking it home to their kids. Um, I'd like to, uh, to switch gears again. And um, if Guadalupe is on the line, talk a little bit to us about your perspective um, uh, regarding some of the things that you've seen uh, at Yale uh, with respect to uh, bringing uh, liver patients back into your clinics and, and maybe comment on some of the things that we have in the past routinely done for our patients, screen for varices um, or uh, what we do in our patients who potentially are in a banding protocol and how you prioritize these patients to come back. Sure, thanks Kim for the questions. Um, so I'm mostly at the VA, and I think that, that what um, Dr. Hamid showed is exactly right. That little circle that he showed is, is not, you know, it's, it's a number of things. And at the end of the day, you know, we have to find out how many patients can safely come in person at a given clinic based on, you know, PPs, based on the safety, based on a, a social distancing. So because there's going to be a limited number of patients, you know, we're going to need to prioritize. And this is what is essential. And just today, um, the VA sent a guidance for prioritization for reopening outpatient consults, procedures, and appointments. And, and I've, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a table that, that essentially they prioritize. So priority one, the patient needs to be seen ASAP, and we're talking face-to-face. -face. Priority two, two to three months. Priority three, three to six months. Priority four, six to nine months. And I would urge everybody to have some kind of idea based on your clinic on what is the priority. So I am going to be doing a screening the, the charts of the patients as, as they're being scheduled to see what priority they belong to and when, and once the clinic opens, which would be first. And we have done this for HCC screening, for example. We looked at all the patients that, that had had their last ultrasound, who had cirrhosis, obviously, and those that had more than a year, we have, we have some that are more than a year. We're considering priority number one, and so we, with the leadership and with our chief of radiology. And again, this requires a lot of interaction. We got together so that we could, um, you know, say these are priority number one. The ones are like already more than a year. Priority. So I'm, I'm sort of modifying this priority list and you have to customize it to your setting. So we have, you, I think that our job as hepatologists is to prioritize the patients. And we have part, different categories. For example, you could have the, the cirrhotic patient and uh, you, you can have the natural or natural patient who needs to be worked up to see if they have cirrhosis. But again, one has to base it on, on clinical findings. For example, a patient with NASH has evidence of cirrhosis, and now you want to stratify them 
by CFPH or not, then they have to come in probably to at least get a fiber scan, for example. Which brings us to once you make the diagnosis of cirrhosis, let's say you see if it's a consult and the patient is likely to have cirrhosis, so now you have wanted to come in to get a fiber scan. So are we going to schedule them for an EGD to screen for varices? And I would say no, because now I think, and, and unfortunately, the Barreno conference did not take place, but I think that now with the Villanueva, the Prodesi study that showed that actually we can prevent not only variceal hemorrhage, but we can prevent decompensation in a compensated patient uh, with clinically significant portal hypertension. Now our goals go beyond preventing variceal hemorrhage. We want to prevent decompensation. And it's not the, obviously a patient who has varices by definition has clinically significant portal hypertension, but a patient who has not had an endoscopy comes to the clinic, has cirrhosis, well, or we think has cirrhosis, we have non-invasive ways of determining whether the patient has clinically significant portal hypertension. And the most probably validated and the strongest probably combination of liver stiffness with platelet count and spleen size. So if you can only have the fiber scan, which is a safer type of procedure, and you decide that the patient likely has clinically significant portal hypertension, one can go ahead and treat these patients with beta blockers, preferably perhaps carvedilol and forego the endoscopy because you're going to treat them anyhow as whether they did or did not, they did not have barriers. But now you have evidence that they have clinically significant portal hypertension. Thanks. I, that, I think that's great guidance uh, for those on the line in terms of... Um, and, and in fact, and in fact, you know, in these times where they couldn't come, even come in for a fiber scan, you could go by the platelet count. The platelet count, and, and, and Dr. Abralde shared with me uh, their anticipated study just looking at the platelet count and the risk of CSPH rises as in the moment the patient's platelet count drops under 150K. So that those are the patients that the lower the platelet count, the higher their chances of having CSPH and therefore those patients would not need an endoscopy. Thank you, Guadalupe. I have two uh, other questions, um, one for Karen and one for Gotham. The first Karen, um, from a patient perspective, we talk about the, the things that we think are barriers to our patients um, facing reentry into our system. Uh, can you give us a bit of insight uh, into in some of the factors that will help our patients feel comfortable coming back to care? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I have spoken with numerous patients. We gather in forums of several thousand people of, throughout the internet. And I think the number one barrier that I'm seeing right now across the board is a lack of technology. And I really like the way Dr. Hamid demonstrated that telemedicine has become part of our norm and it will continue to be in the future. And in private polls, uh, patients consider this relationship with their doctors to be really vital, especially with the hepatitis, when they're afraid, they want to talk to you, but they're enjoying the use of telemedicine. And um, I've even had doctors, it reminds me of the old time um, doctor home visits with his black bag, because one lady even said, I brought my dog into the room while I was talking to my doctor online, and my doctor brought his dog into the room, and, and they felt very warm. They felt an intimacy that they hadn't experienced with their doctor before. And I think that's even when they get back into the clinic, it's really increased confidence that they feel. Um, I think that the technological barrier can be overcome with phone apps at the very least, emails, communications, whether they're setting up an appointment or what to expect when they roll into the parking lot, you know, and their caregivers told to wait. Uh, patients are really fine with sitting in the car and getting a text and um, they're, they're very trusting of what's going on for the most part. They trust that you guys are doing the right thing. I think uh, the second bear outside of technology, I'll veer off. Patients who lack caregivers or who don't have that psychosocial network are at a disadvantage because maybe they don't know how to access or use technology and they don't really have anybody helping them monitoring their food pantry, their prescriptions, their uh, comorbid conditions, especially hepatic encephalopathy, which can't always be detected with labs and only a family member would know. So you guys have kind of already addressed this um, with the ASLD uh, COVID-19 task force, and you're kind of solving that problem. It's under the direction of Dr. Lake, and we're assembling some fact sheets and infographics 
and this is ways for doctors and clinics and even through social media to educate and inform their patients. And so some of these guidelines are going to address, um, I'm using a term called self-monitoring. And so we talked about patients, and I heard talk about not coming to the emergency room. Patients are doing a lot of self-monitoring right now, but it needs right. to be done with wisdom. And um, so about, you know, their dietary concerns, getting regular med, a lab tests, um, you know, watching out for those comorbid conditions. You know, they're taking their temperature, they're doing their blood pressure, and um, yet they're still frightened and they still want to be sure that those, um, like, uh, I really like what they're doing out at UCSF, as uh, he said with Dr. Harid, where there's policies in place. And so there's PPE, taking the temperature, staggering appointments, disinfecting routines. Patients are real quick to gain confidence. And I heard that word used a lot as well. So um, Dr. Heron, you used that word. And uh, I had written this paragraph before because I was a little nervous addressing such an illustrious crowd. I'm thankful for this opportunity. But confidence is a word that I hear a lot with patients. While no one can predict what will happen next with the novel coronavirus, we trust in your education, your experience, and your empathy. And we're touched and we're filled with compassion for all of the medical staff that are serving us. And we do have confidence that you're going to help us face this coming year with the coronavirus. When, you know, when it comes to vaccines, whatever happens, we'll take your word for it. And for the most part, we'll be compliant because that's what we do. And uh, with that in mind, we're expediting these patient-facing documents, like I said, under the supervision of the ASLD, based on your own recommendations. And we're trying to make it a good visual for patients and I'm honored to address this audience today. And thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate that insight. Uh, we have one final question uh, for Dr. Reddy. And, and really, uh, Dr. Reddy, given your work in the fellowship training, both for GI as well as hepatology and transplantation, what has your strategy been to bring patients, I mean fellows, back to clinical care? And specifically for your one-year transplant fellows, how are you ensuring that they're getting through all of their requirements? So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, Kim. Um, so uh, you know, roughly six or seven weeks ago, um, I, I think just you know, here in Chicago, um, everything sort of shut down with the exception of sort of COVID. All the elective stuff went away. So our our services really um, declined uh, in in size. So we we basically took all of our fellows, whether they be advanced uh, hepatology or nutrition or IBD fellows, and and, and combine them with our GI fellows. Um, and we limited the number of people on service. We went to much shorter rotation uh, lengths. From we went from four weeks to one week um, with different people on the weekend to really sort of even out the exposure. And we we definitely got our fellows' input every step of the way. We wanted them to feel as safe, and we wanted this to be as fair of a process as possible. Um, we pulled fellows off of, of endoscopy. We pulled them off of of other elective rotations, and we built kind of a very robust backup system. Um, we thought we were two or three weeks behind New York and we would see massive increases of COVID patients. Um, and really, we didn't see the spike we thought we would see. We, I think our hospital, we got up to about 140 to 150 patients total at any given time in the hospital. And it's gone down um, to about 110 to 120. Unfortunately, it seemed to, our, our, we've seemed to reach a plateau in the last two or two and a half weeks and hasn't really dropped. But we, uh, the governor did say we could go back to doing some quote unquote elective procedures. Um, so we're starting to see the hospital services pick back up again. In fact, um, next week we're going back to our uh, pre-COVID schedules now, in terms of making sure our fellows didn't miss things, um, we did involve them with telehealth visits, although our system for telehealth is a little bit clunky and it's hard to staff things as like we did, um, but our volumes are, are, are reasonable. And then we sort of went, as one of my fellows called it, an academic surge, um, and we increased our online uh, educational from uh, of hours from about three to four hours a week to seven or eight hours a week with a lot of robust input from the faculty. So there was a lot of teaching going on during that time and a lot of writing and, and some of our fellows have been very productive. So um, it may not have been as much hands-on patient care, but I think there's been a lot of 
training different ways. We've found um, different online materials for them to use. Um, we've done a lot of endoscopy stuff online with some of our advanced endoscopy guys showing some techniques about what they do on a daily basis. Um, we are looking forward to um, getting back to some more routines. Um, we started letting fellows scope again, just the inpatients a couple of weeks ago, and I'm hoping by next week or so, we'll let them scope outpatients. A lot of this is driven by local standards and what they'll let us do. We've been fortunate in that we have our own system to sterilize N95 masks, so that seems to be less of an issue for us, uh, at least right now. Um, uh, but we are hoping that um, we can get back to more hands-on learning um, in the next uh, week or so, but there has been probably a six, six or seven week uh, decrease in the amount of hands-on care, but I think we've made it up with a combination of cognitive and, and other research and academic uh, output. Thank you, Gotham. Um, I just want to thank uh, this was a, a really a great overview by all of you. I wanna thank all of our presenters, um, all of our panelists uh, for your contributions and your engagement uh, tonight on the webinar. Uh, this slide uh, really goes over some of the uh, additional resources that AASLD is providing for COVID-19. Uh, you can uh, follow the webpage as it's seen there. You can join uh, the Engage a community where there is a COVID specific discussion board. Uh, there is um, uh, your opportunity to submit uh, your articles for publication uh, and fast tracking review of all of the original COVID-19 articles and case reports that are submitted. Um, so please, uh, please use those resources and thank you all for attending um, and your participation tonight.